All right. Hello, welcome. I am Sarah Kirspell. I am the Coordinator of Engagement and Outreach for the DAR Museum. If you abbreviate my title, I am the museum CEO. Uh, but what that means is I am in charge of a lot of the uh, virtual and social media and online things. So uh, today I would like to welcome you to our Tuesday talk. This is a monthly series typically taking place on the second Tuesday of the month. And we do a combination of hybrid and in-person and um, strictly virtual events. And so uh, we thank you for joining us online and we thank you for joining us in person. We're glad that you are all here. Uh, keep an eye on our event calendar. We do have uh, afternoon programs, um, programs uh, on the weekends, on Saturdays especially. We have uh, family days that are activities. And then we also have the UFO, which stands for Unfinished Object Craft Circle. So you can come here, bring your uh, unfinished project and join other people with unfinished projects and socialize and, and join them here as well. Uh, and then our next Tuesday talk is going to be strictly virtual. It's going to be uh, about gelatin, which I'm really excited about the history of gelatin. And uh, you can sign up for that in the same place that you signed up for the, the Zoom here. Uh, but without further ado, let me introduce you to Emily. Emily is uh, she works at the National Museum of African American History and Culture as a contracted textile co collection specialist for uh, NM NMAHC or NMOX Black Fashion Museum Collection. She specializes in fashion history, the material culture of disability through the lens of clothing, and the care of historic textiles. So without further ado, Emily, please join us. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, thank you, Sarah, for facilitating this talk and all the logistics that go into it. Thank you to Alden and the DAR Museum for supporting my research. And also thank you, of course, to those who are attending this lecture, either in person or virtually. In 1833, the newspaper Genius of Liberty published the article Anti-Courses. As indicated by its title, the article criticized women for wearing the structured undergarments that molded their bodies. The newspaper cited the musings of Dr. Mussey, who argued that the most fashionable ladies who others envied for their clothing and splendid figures were compelled to pad in wad and lay in a yard or two of cloth upon one shoulder bone to conceal this very deformity, their restrictive clothing. Mussey's words were intended to shame women for their adoption of fashion trends that he and his contemporaries viewed as fatal to one's spinal health. However, through this passage, we catch a glimpse of women with spinal curvatures actively shaping representations of themselves through dress. As noted by Mussey himself, people often could not tell whether a fashionable woman had a spinal curvature, such as scoliosis, because of her bodice's intentionally placed padding and tailoring. Rather, others desired her figure. 20 years later, on February 3rd, 1853 in Pembroke, New Hampshire, 41-year-old Sarah Ann Galt married 44-year-old Matthias Nutter. For her wedding, Sarah wore a purple silk dress refashioned from an older garment, as indicated by the ghosts of old pleats, folds, and hems, that are still visible in the dress's silk. For her dresses refashioning, Sarah hired her dressmaker and neighbor, Rebecca Noyes Chase Cram. No known rec written records document these two women's relationship or the construction of Sarah's wedding dress. But by studying the gown itself, we gain valuable insight. In addition to remaking an older dress for Sarah's wedding, Rebecca also cut and tailored the bodice to perfectly accommodate her client's spinal curvature. Because of the historic stigma that surrounds physical disabilities, a misinformed narrative that disabled people did not affect their communities, belongings, and environments has persisted. Consequently, disabled people's agency tends to be limited, if not erased from historic records. Material culture related to disability, however, helps restore their histories and presence. Objects convey knowledge about people's lived experiences, relationships with others, and their bodies' interactions with physical surroundings, including clothing, which specifically preserves memories of the body. Today's presentation will explore how ultimately dress and disability are inextricably linked. 
Throughout the 19th century, information about the symptoms, causes, and treatments of spinal curvatures were found in countless medical treatises, public opinion articles, and etiquette manuals. Because of the spinal column's critical role in protecting the spinal cord, medical professionals feared the comorbidities and risks that a spinal curvature or injury introduced. Therefore, an aggressive campaign to diagnose and cure spinal curvatures prevailed. In total, there are 33 vertebrae that are stacked on top of one another to form the spinal column, or the spine, and it serves three vital functions. It protects the spinal curve and nerves, cord and nerves enables a person to move and bend, and balances the body's shifting weight. A spinal curvature may form in any one or more of the spine's three main segments, which on the screen you can see are the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. As seen in skeletal models and diagrams, the spine possesses a natural curve, but once this surpassed a certain degree of curvature, typically 10 degrees, medical professionals began to intervene for fear of the person's overall health. In 1861, for example, surgeon Holmes Coote argued that curvatures, specifically scoliosis, caused the muscles to atrophy, compressed the lungs and hindered respiration, constrained the heart, twisted the veins, led to nausea-inducing headaches, and at times even resulted in paralysis. Concerns about the body's functions, therefore, motivated the medical field to share their concerns and studies of spinal disabilities with the general public. According to medical statistics, spinal curvatures appeared much more frequently in women than men. For instance, in the 1832 publication, Spinal Deformities Cured and Prevented, P.G. Hammond, a professor of gymnastics, addressed that the reader will perhaps be astonished at the numerous instances of deformity arising from distortion of the spine, especially among English females. Hammond reached this statement by gathering data from groups of boys and girls from different age ranges, which revealed to him that spinal curvatures affected one in 20 women. As a result of statistics such as Hammond's, many surgeons and orthopedic specialists focused their writings on women's physiology and habits. Informed by clinical research and shaped by 19th century social values, orthopedic surgeons and physicians concluded that women themselves cause their predisposition to spinal curvatures with their adoption of certain fashion trends being one of the lead culprits. For example, physician James Coles wrote, certainly nothing has tended more to increase spinal deformities in modern times than the absurd and pernicious use of tight stays and all those other artificial means that have been devised by fraud or by folly to improve the figure of young females. Featured on the screen, is a print included in Dr. Brown's, Dr. John Brown's 1845 publication about his observations at the Boston Orthopedic Institution. According to Brown, every form of corset, whether tight-laced or not, both produced and worsened spinal curvatures. He argued that these undergarments stunted organ growth, weakened back muscles, and permanently altered the shape of the rib cage, which this illustration depicts. The 1869 article on tight lacing also exemplified this perceived link between dress and disability. As indicated by its title, the article confronted tight lacing, the practice of lacing one's stays or corset by increments to achieve an extremely small waist and hourglass silhouette. Similar to medical essays, the article informed readers about the importance of the back's muscles and spinal support and exclaimed that, their power is destroyed, what a pity this is, by tight stays, and then the back assumes a curvature. How grievous that one cannot be at once slender and straight. Although corsets primarily supported the bust and spine and were not intended for this extreme constriction, those women who did tight lace compressed their heart, lungs, and spine. In the 1866 article, Injurious Effect of Tight Lacing, an etching compares the outline of a modern woman's waist with its abnormally wide collarbone, shortened spine, and cramped organs to the divine form of Venus. The author pressed woman to adore how the ribcage of Venus widened around the lungs 
and to condemn the physical damage incurred by restrictive clothing. According to this article, fashion provoked an injudicious and deforming process on the spine, weakening the back muscles, bending the spinal column, rounding the shoulders, and overall, giving rise to those lateral curvatures which so many women know by hours of excruciating pain. Further associating fashion with spinal disabilities, the author then asks readers, how many women think you are free from these curvatures? In all probability, not one in 10 of those whom you meet. Although critiques of tight lacing often exaggerated the popularity of this waist reducing practice, enough women adopted this trend for it to become a sensationalized topic. An early 1870s tintype of two women holding hands depicts just how drastically tight lacing affected one's bodily proportions. The woman on the viewer's right tight laced, while her counterpart did not. Through this image, we can envision how this construct constrictive practice appeared beyond its two-dimensional representations in print. In addition to her tightly silhouette, the unidentified woman also presents symptoms characteristic of spinal curvatures. Both her left shoulder and hip are elevated. Therefore, she and her adoption of this fashion trend were the very targets that dress critics attacked. In 1846, Dr. James Coles shared with colleagues how he determined whether a patient exhibited signs of scoliosis. Coles traced his patient's vertebral column with ink from the neck to the pelvis, and if a spinal curvature had developed, the distance of two shoulder blades from the line so marked will be found unequal, the right towards which the column in the majority of cases curves being nearer by from one eighth of an inch to half an inch than the left. Essentially, by drawing a line down the center of the torso, surgeons found that because of a spinal curvature, one shoulder would be closer to the center line than the other with a difference in measurements that ranged between an eighth to a half inch, sometimes even more. A method similar to Coles' diagnostic process can be used when assessing if a garment was altered or tailored to accommodate for a spinal curvature. 19th century bodices were fitted to a woman's corset and torso and required precise fittings and construction. By comparing the measurements of these bodices to the expected symmetry of the torso, we can assess the potential effects of spinal curvatures on a woman's shoulders, hips, and other key fitting points. I applied this method to four garments, which I'll be sharing shortly. And through my research, I've determined that two dressmaking techniques specific to spinal curvatures existed asymmetrically placed padding and differently sized bodice panels. When working on the exhibit Spectrum of Fashion at the Maryland Center for History and Culture around 2018, 2019, our team noticed that the bodice of this 1840s pink silk dress featured asymmetrically placed padding that veered away from the period's typical construction techniques. Sewn into the bodice's left back panel, is a layer of one inch thick padding, which is on the screen in the picture on the right, which meant when preparing this dress's exhibit mannequin, extra padding was added to the form's right shoulder blade to achieve a proper smooth fit. Further research showed this to be an indication, along with other construction details, that this woman had a spinal curvature she actively disguised through dress. Measurements taken between the shoulder blades as identified by the dashed lines in this digitized diagram of the bodice, align with Dr. Coles' medical explanation of how a lateral curvature affected the torso's proportions. In both measurements of this unidentified woman's dress, the right shoulder blade varied from a quarter to a half inch smaller than her left. Informed by the period's medical literature, the woman's spinal curvature likely caused her right shoulder blade to extend outwards. To divert attention from this difference and create a smooth fit, a layer of this lambswool padding was sewn to the left back panel. At first glance, perhaps the sizable stain that discolors the front of this 1867 to 1869 silk evening bodice catches one's attention. Upon opening the bodice, however, its inner lining provides a clear visualization of how the intentional placement of pads 
can indicate a case of spinal curvature. Two lamb's wool pads are sewn into the bodice's right breast and left shoulder, two areas often affected by curvatures in the spine. Dr. John Brown informed readers that a lateral curvature could be identified when one shoulder grows out and there is a flattening of the chest on the opposite side and one hip is higher than the other. The placement of the evening bodice's padding at the shoulder blade and opposite breast correspond to this description. Additionally, as Brown's excerpt mentioned, spinal curvatures could affect the size and skeletal structure of the hip, which is also present in this evening bodice. Measurements of the bodice hip contours show a one inch width difference. The length is the same, but the construction intentionally widened on the left, most likely to accommodate for the differences in development. In contrast to the first two garments, Sarah Ann Galt's 1853 wedding dress does not feature a symmetrically placed padding. Without this visually defining indicator of spinal curvatures, how else can a garment's association with this disability be identified? As seen with the 1840s pink dress, hypotheses about a wearer's spinal condition can emerge when preparing a garment for display. When Sarah's dress was first displayed in an exhibit at the DAR years ago, the team noted that she, uh, that the mannequin required a curving spine to ensure a proper fit, as well as for its current display in Sewn in America, making meaning memory. Last summer, I was able to take thorough measurements of the bodice and also take photos to demonstrate what this process looks like. Sarah's dress was the most recent one I've studied, so by this point, the process became much more streamlined, and I'm hoping to revisit my previous case studies in future ones to really make the process uniform. When measuring Sarah's bodice, we measured the width of each back panel in two inch increments, which you can see in this digital diagram, to really see where and how her spinal curvature affected her anatomy. Ultimately, the left back panel was narrower towards the top and then wider from the middle of the torso to the lower back, perhaps indicating a double curvature. Additionally, and one of the key indicators that first really brought attention to the possibility of a curvature was the difference in shoulder length and height when placing Sarah's dress on a form. Measurements, which are shown on the screen, show a quarter inch difference in length. For the fourth and final case study, an 1870s to 1880s wool paisley wrapper highlights how informal garments worn within the comfort of one's home were also fitted precisely to correspond to a woman's spinal curvature. An 1853 Godey's Ladies Book article advised that every lady who can afford it should own a wrapper because they are far more convenient in health, while to an invalid, the comfort can only be known by experience. As the article explains, this garment was relatively unstructured and lacked boning, and its sleeves were often loose and open, although not in this wrapper's case. While some could be constructed from less expensive textiles, others combined various high quality fabrics or mixing different prints, such as this wool paisley and velvet wrapper at the Fashion Archives and Museum of Shippensburg University. Like the pink 1840s dress and Sarah's 1853 wedding gown, it wasn't until the wrapper was placed on a mannequin that the garment required significantly more padding on the left shoulder blade to ensure a smooth, proper fit. Upon taking detailed measurements, the differences in the bodice panel sizes became evident. Consistently, the left bodice panel ranged from a quarter to three eighths inch larger than the right. These surviving garments highlight that physically disabled women have not only existed in history, but also actively impacted their surrounding material environments. Simultaneously, however, as we've seen, a paradox existed. These women notified and designed their clothing to ease discomfort, both physical and social, but the medical field and popular American magazines adamantly argued that women's clothing and ultimately their dressmakers who would encourage the adoption of the latest fashion trends 
caused spinal curvatures to form in the first place. As noted, literature published from different disciplines often focused on women's spinal health. And an important reason for this was that society connected one's posture to morality and in general, the fears of physical differences. By the 18th century, ideals of, ideals of gentility and refinement that required the strategic shaping of one's outward appearance became more formalized with the proliferation of etiquette manuals. These manuals evolved by attributing more secrecy and embarrassment to the personal body. Topics such as flatulence, bowel movement, and childbirth became less explicit in these accounts and sexuality and other bodily functions were meant to stay hidden. When out in public or entertaining guests at in the home, both women and men presented their bodies as immaculate. These conduct manuals formulated the ideal citizen for readers to imitate and incorporate into their daily gestures and movements. Interactions with others became a delicate dance that teetered between avoiding attention and achieving recognition, a performance that reflected society's prescribed values more so than a person's actual behaviors and individuality. If someone deviated from these social standards, the facade of gentility crumbled and they became vulnerable to the stare that assessed one's claim to refinement and citizenship. Within etiquette manuals and American magazines during this period, we can pinpoint numerous publications that linked one's external appearance to their inner morality. The 1817 etiquette manual, Near of Graces, included the words of a writer identified as Dr. Knox, who argued that taste requires a congruity between the internal character and the external appearance. Additionally, in an 1847 health and beauty article, Godey's Ladies Book romanticized the ideal upper body that women strove to achieve, a triangular shape defined by wide shoulders that tapered down into a cinched waist. According to Godey's, poor carriage marred a woman's beauty and body. The author remarked that women know that stooping or rounded shoulders are alike destructive of elegance and health and are decidedly vulgar, marking ignoble descent and denoting weakness in age. With the proliferation of etiquette manuals, a degree of self-determination fell upon individuals. Publications that aided in the pursuit of refinement encouraged and guided readers in their efforts of self-improvement and mastery over the body. Because of society's perceived link between posture and morality, Women with spinal curvatures managed an extra barrier when presenting their bodies as refined and their character as pure. Subsequently, clothing played an important role in molding the body into a socially acceptable form that protected disabled women from the exploitative gaze. Individuals placed a significant amount of trust in and vulnerability with their seamstress as a result. Fittings required a woman to disrobe down to her undergarments for a dressmaker to properly measure her for her specific clothing needs, a process that possibly revealed a physical disability society judged as grotesque and monstrous. Dressmakers were held to secrecy when privy to the intimate details of a client's figure, a professional requirement that very ironically, pamphlets and advertisements publicly noted in detail. The London Tradesman, a 1747 publication that described all the trades and professions in London and Westminster, expressed this expected secrecy. For the staymaker, the artisan who would create these structured undergarments, the London Tradesman argued that he ought to be a very polite tradesman as he approaches the lady so nearly. He is obliged to secrecy in many instances where he is obliged by art to mend a crooked sh shape bolster up a fallen hip or distorted shoulder. Of the two and a half pages dedicated to describing the staymaker's profession, the entire first page emphasizes this role of mending a crooked shape, a testament to the commonness of spinal curvatures and the cultural values that pressured women to disguise their disabilities. The passage later claims 
that women with spinal curvatures owed her able-bodied shape to steel and whalebone, her natural self, when deposited in the bridal bed as a mere lump of animated deformity, fitter far for the undertaker than to be initiated in the mysteries of connubial joy. As dramatically told in this entry's prose, women with spinal curvatures required the assistance of staymakers to confine, confine their body into a veneer of able-bodiedness. Otherwise, any potential husband and promise of motherhood would be thwarted by her so-called animated deformity. Staymakers played a central role in concealing physical differences and as indicated by the advertising of this responsibility, the public acknowledged the necessity for their skills in achieving social acceptance. In this same publication, the description for the mantua maker those who designed and created gowns in the 18th century, also highlighted this professional requirement. For though the staymaker does his business as nicely as possible and conceals all deformities with the greatest art, the mantua maker must discover them at some times. She must see them and pretend to be blind. And at all times, she must swear herself to secrecy. She must learn to flatter all complexions, praise all shapes, and in a word, ought to be complete mistress of the art of dissimulation or the art of hiding under a false appearance. When a client revealed her disability to a stay maker or mantua maker, secrecy was expected. In a society where one's physical appearance reflected their intentions and morality, a spinal curvature threatened a woman's social acceptance and success in obtaining marriage. Through excerpts such as these, we can sense the trust and sensitivity embedded in Sarah and Rebecca's relationship, especially as Sarah's dress was worn for her wedding. Of the garments I've studied, Sarah's is the only instance where we know not only her name, but also her dressmakers. Although little to no archival materials survive that record the lives of and friendship between Sarah and Rebecca, the United States' 1850 federal census provides us with an important detail. Conducted three years before Sarah's marriage to Matthias, this census informs us that she lived with her parents and two brothers, Andrew and Trueworthy Dudley. The census takers marked the Galt household as dwelling number 170, and after gathering the family's data, the officials moved onwards to the neighboring property identified as dwelling number 171. The owners of the property were none other than Rebecca and her husband, Rule, and daughter, Ellen. Through, through the years 1850 to 1853, the two women remained in close proximity to one another, and enough of a relationship was formed that Sarah trusted Rebecca with sewing her wedding dress. And when Rebecca finished sewing, this, this proximity was forever preserved via needle and thread. Surviving garments altered for spinal curvatures such as Sarah's show how dressmakers smoothed out curves and hollows, helping women feel comfortably supported, achieve a polished silhouette, and visually hide their disability from the public eye. The article Injurious Effect of Tight Lacing, once again, stated how the dressmaker could tell how many women require padding to make a dress hide the deformity, expressing the dressmaker's unique position. Passers-by in the street, or maybe even family friends, could remain ignorant of the woman's spinal curvature. But the dressmaker knew about the disability and the measures taken to direct attention away from perceivable symptoms. This tightly woven link between staymakers and their roles in disguising disability is further demonstrated in the anonymous Philip Jones's essay on crookedness. Jones began his career as a staymaker, and he noted that the opportunity of seeing the human frame variously distorted led to my invention to different kinds of contrivances to hide the defects of form from the observing eye. Jones presented his unique position as both an orthopedic specialist and staymaker two professions that required a familiarity with the body to establish his credibility in the field. The medical field also acknowledged the dressmaker's value in reaffirming a woman's physical and social comfort. 
When informing readers about the development of a second curvature of the spine, Brown noted that when one shoulder began to grow out, the dress keeps sliding from off the other, and the dressmaker begins to call for padding so as to fill up the deficiency on one side and make an apparent uniformity in the appearance of the back. Constantly repositioning her bodice added yet another level of self-awareness, and medical practitioners recognized the importance of dress alteration in remediating this. Both the efforts to minimize the spinal curvature's visibility through dress and the confidentiality expected from the seamstress, however, could easily be rendered obsolete by bulky medical braces. Therefore, designers and prescribers of these devices often described them as unobtrusive, comfortable, discreet, and even fashionable. After removing her spinal brace, a patient at the Boston Orthopedic Institution wore a wire stock that supported the neck so that she would not overextend her back muscles without the brace's assistance. An accompanying print illustrated this wire stock and offered solutions in transforming it into its own fashionable accessory. Dr. Brown recommended folding it into a neckerchief as a stiffener and tying it in front to resemble a fashionable cotton muslin collar of the time. He also suggested covering the wire in velvet and tying it around the neck to imitate the ribbons that women often wore in the 1840s. Physicians prescribed correctional devices to provide patients with musculoskeletal support, but they also paid attention to women's fashion trends that could be applied to these apparatuses. Shoulder straps, another type of support device, simultaneously supported the back muscles and remained hidden with their elasticity and lightness that prevented any obvious lines to be seen through the fabric. In another advertisement, brass stays featuring side crutches presented no unsightliness nor demand alteration in the dress reassuring women that they would not have to pay for a dressmaker's time and labor. In his book of engravings regarding spinal curvatures and their treatment, Dr. John Shaw included an illustration that depicts six spinal brace designs with his accompanying descriptions of each. According to Shaw's section on figure five's brace, a supporter of this mechanism success urged that it should not be considered as a machine, but as a pair of stays in which ladies might go to court. Whether designed to be visually inconspicuous, fashioned into a clothing accessory, or as claimed by Shaw's brace, its own sartorial statement, spinal braces and medical machines often consider the social comfort of women. Mentions of dressmakers and clothing trends indicated that professionals in the medical field acknowledge the important relationship between dress and disability, dressmaker and client. Extant garments specifically tailored or altered for spinal curvatures underscore once again how women modify their clothing for their own comfort and as well as their own personal fashion tastes. A significant piece of information missing from these artifacts is of course, the visual presence of the wearer herself, an absence which photographs help to restore. Photographs visually preserve how women with spinal curvatures dressed, adjusted their stances for better comfort, and adopted or rejected certain trends to better minimize the appearance of a physical disability. Photographer Marcus Aurelius Root taught readers in his 1864 textbook, The Camera and the Pencil, that if a shawl or boa or like article dress be thrown lightly over the shoulders and tastefully deposed, so as to hide some defect, it will generally serve to balance other parts. Various 19th century photographs presented in this section illustrate that women with spinal curvatures did indeed intentionally wear certain articles of clothing to minimize the spinal curvature's appearance. For my research that looks into photographs, I worked directly with a physical therapist with a specialization in spinal health. And together we looked through dozens of historic photos during which he would confirm certain cases of spinal curvatures and explain just how their specific curvature impacted posture. Capes provided a simple and fashionable solution 
for women trying to diminish the appearance of their spinal curvature in photographs. For her daguerreotype appointment that took place in 1847 or 1848, an unidentified woman chose to wear a striped, possibly silk dress. Overall, its construction strongly resembles the pink dress, especially with the self-fabric cape completing each ensemble. For her studio photograph, the unidentified woman further embellished her outfit with a printed ribbon tied around her neck, the accessory that Dr. Brown recommended to patients when transforming a wire neck stock from an assistive medical device into its own article of clothing. Together, her cape and ribbon covered her shoulders and neck where her symptoms were most visually apparent. Besides the wearing of boas, shawls, and capes, the intentional arrangement of one's hair and rejection of certain clothing accessories also acted as tools to hide disability. Between 1848 and 1850, two women entered a studio for a double portrait. Both wore either a cotton or wool shally printed floral dress, a popular design motif for the decade. Unlike her companion, however, the woman on our left abandoned the fashionable black lace mitts and arranged her hair by parting it down the side. These two details may seem minuscule, but they point to the intentional efforts of this woman to diminish the appearance of her curvature and instead bring focus to her selfhood and personal relationship. By not wearing the black openwork lace mitts that drew the eyes focus with their dark saturation in the daguerreotype, as you can see with her partner here, the woman directed attention away from her hips misalignment. Additionally, by rejecting the center part typical in women's hairstyles, she drew eyes upwards and thus balanced her two shoulders by visually elevating her left. Indeed, Root acknowledged in his textbook by that by a proper arrangement of the hair, great defects in personal beauty are most effectually remedied. Another option for women seeking to divert attention from their physical disability was the use of specific poses and angles. In a situation where a sitter was blind in one eye, Root suggested that the defect may be partially concealed and yet an exact likeness secured by taking a two thirds or three fourths view of the face or perhaps even a profile view. The poses of a Pennsylvanian woman in a collection of photographs covering the years 1887 to 1893 demonstrate Root's advice and the power of angles. Between 1887 and 1889, two sisters arrived at a studio in Hanover, Pennsylvania for a series of three cabinet cards, two individual photographs of each sister and one of them standing together. In their duet image, where both placed an arm atop a covered table or pillar, the woman on our left faced the camera while her companion, who displayed characteristics of thoracic, thoracic kyphosis, a forward curvature of the upper back, twisted away. For her individual portrait, she maintained this twist, almost exaggerating it even more by resting both arms on a chair's back. Certain poses may have alleviated the physical pain and discomfort caused by spinal curvatures. As Philip Jones noted in his essay on crookedness in 1788, when the spine is relaxed and rendered very weak from any cause, the patient seeks relief by leaning on tables, chairs, etc. Leaning on a surface and then twisting away followed Root's photographic advice, but it also potentially relieved tightness and discomfort as this is actually a practice used today in physical therapy for those with spinal curvatures. In 1893, she paid for another individual photograph and she maintained a pose comparable to the double portrait taken with her sister in the late 1880s. Leaning against a studio prop, she rotated her body at an angle and turned her face towards the camera. Shortly after this in 1894, she and a man who was most likely her husband sat for a cabinet card, possibly to commemorate their newlywed status. They situated themselves in a conventional pose, 
where one may be seated while the other stands nigh him, leaning familiarly on the latter shoulder or chair back. Leaning may have provided physical comfort or disguised her thoracic kyphosis, but it also followed typical studio photography posturing that symbolized the intimate connections between two sitters. In April 1854, little over a year after her marriage to Matthias Nutter, Sarah Ann Galt unfortunately passed away. We know very little about her life or how she died at the age of just 42. Fortunately, the survival of her dress with her and Rebecca Noyes Chase Cram's names provide us a glimpse into their lives and connection to disability. And importantly, the disabled women did indeed modify their material belongings despite their limited representation and historic records. Studying the garments designed, altered, and worn by women with spinal curvatures provides a remarkable opportunity to understand how they physically moved and navigated in a society that often treated their disability with scorn and fear. Bodices padded with an extra layer of lamb's wool wadding or a decorative ribbon wrapped around a wire stock that supported the neck helped to ease social discomfort. Objects worn close to the body, such as clothing itself and assistive devices, were bonded to the wearer's experiences and her presentation of self. Although etiquette manuals, medical essays, and magazine articles depicted spinal curvatures as a fatal condition for both health and social acceptance, these women's objects and photographs revealed their disability was simply a reality of everyday life. Indeed, when posing for portraits and photographer studios, their selfhood and relationships with others were placed in focus while their disability faded into the background, often accomplished through their clothing and accessories. Material culture related to disability can be found everywhere and by approaching sources with the methodology of disability studies, we begin to restore disabled women's agency and ensure that their presence is remembered. Thank you. We have a question from um, our virtual audience. How did these created spinal issues affect intimacy and pregnancy? That is a really interesting question. I did not um, research that particular aspect of spinal curvatures since I was focusing on dress construction, but it is, I mean, it would be really interesting and I'm sure there is research about how that does affect pregnancy. So I'm sorry, I can't answer that question like in a better, more detailed way. Any other questions? Oh, um, uh, Vicki online would like to know, how did you come to be interested in this topic? Um, a mix, I think. Uh, I grew up with a mom who was um, an occupational therapist, so these were frequently topics that we would have. And then you know, I took a disability studies seminar in my grad school, and that is when this passion just really hit me. And for one of the assignments, our final paper was to focus on a topic of disability history, and I remembered working on the Spectrum of Fashion exhibit and the pink dress, and I thought, maybe there's something there. And indeed there was, and I was kind of shocked by how much mention there was of dressmakers and clothing related to women's final curvatures. So that's the short answer of how I got into this topic. I do have a question. I know you focused on women, but there probably was some men uh, did you do any research on men's clothing at all on what they did? I did not. There was less information about men's um, like cases of spinal curvatures as it related to garments. And that's largely because this was a gender disability. So there were case studies of men who were um, affected by spinal curvatures, but it was mostly about how those they would be cured or treated, while women, because it was believed that they caused spinal curvatures to form in themselves, that clothing really came up frequently. I have one more. How, did you look at anything where they tried to diagnose it earlier um, to try to get preventative things? Did you look at that at all? Yes, so um, in my research, I have this whole section that is about, um, they really did start with 
children and girls. And many of the literature, the essays, either from the medical field or more of those, you know, American magazines for the public audience, they were often targeted towards mothers and they would inform them that they should stop allowing their children to embroider for so many hours as it would constrict their posture and they would bend over and um, also stop them from writing or painting and encourage them to keep running around with their belt boy counterparts in the yard where one um, essay says that they should be chasing and tumbling in the yard with cats like the boys were. So there was an attempt to do early intervention as it was easier, they believed, to cure it and straighten the spine before um, the bones were really formed into that curvature. Thank you so much. Thank you.